Great. OK, so right. Apart from that slight false start, everybody, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, the discussion about Beltane Energy. So it's great to see um, some of you here. Thank you very much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's always nice to see a few faces and know because um, so often we're just talking to a blank screen and looking at the camera and it's like, I wonder if anybody's actually listening. But it's nice to be able to see some faces or some blank cameras for those of you who don't want to uh, don't want you to be seen. So, yeah, we're in for a really, um, a really special good weekend this weekend. Um, it's one of my favourite times of the year. Um, Beltane, I love Beltane. And um, and also we've got a um, solar new moon eclipse coming up tomorrow. And we have the fixed day of Beltane on Sunday, which is really, um, it has various um, rituals around it in the UK and in Ireland. So in Ireland, it's all about, I used to go um, dressing May trees as a child, um, a well blessing. In the UK, there's a lot of well blessing that still goes on. So it's really a time to associate with, um, you know, with water and with earth. And then we've also got um, Beltane itself which is sort of, you know, fire and sky, if you like. So it's basically over this few days, the four elements are very present in our lives. So the actual astronomical Beltane will occur this year on the 5th of May. And I think it's 2.25 in the afternoon. So that's when the sun reaches this 15 degrees in the, uh, 19 degrees, 15 degrees. Do you know, I've gone blank. Um, my astrology friend does all this for me. Um, in Taurus. So it's just at that moment, the sun reaches this point and that, is one of these esoteric events. Now, we have a run up in terms of earth energy changes to that kind of, um, that pinnacle, um, because energy changes over time. There's a lot of work on earth energy that kind of looks at things as fixed, but things aren't fixed, are they? We go through these seasons, we go through lunar cycles. So a lot of energy is always in a perpetual state of motion, whether it's located, but the flow changes, or whether it shifts about, whether it's form changes, it's structure changes. Because if we think about the seasons, we don't suddenly finish winter on day one and go, yay, it's going to be X degrees warmer tomorrow. There's suddenly going to be X amount more daylight. We have these gradual shifts and, and they reach these pinnacles of midwinter, midsummer, the equinoxes. Then we have these more subtle shifts on the cross quarter days as we move around the Celtic, the wheel of time. Um, and then the, the so, Beltane is the midpoint between midsummer and the start of spring. So we just get into that 10 past the hour kind of thing or quarter past the hour before we hit the, um, the, next, the next point. So we have these, these probably the wrong point on the wheel, but you know what I mean? We have these, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pivotal moment. And I became fascinated, as I say, by Beltane. For those of you who watched the video, um, Zoom, oh, Donna says Zoom won't let me turn the video on. Yeah, Zoom was weird the last few days. I was trying to record a meeting the other night just to break my thread. So you're not the only one. If you can't put your video on, it's not because it um, won't. It's just, um, it's, um, it just, Zoom doesn't see, I say it's Mercury retrograde. So I became fascinated by Beltane. Anyway, get back to the point. When I moved to Ireland as a child, so I lived up until, in England, up until the age of nine. And then we moved to Ireland to a Crofter Cottage. Now, before that, I'd always seen Earth energy. And I thought, I can see all these flows. But I lived in sort of a, a not massively urban, but an urban-ish area. And then I moved to the middle of nowhere. And holy bloody moly, I had never seen Earth energy like you have in Ireland. It was astronomical. I just spent my whole time living there, basically as high as a kite, out of body, traversing astrally projecting down ley lines spending hours off with the she the fairy folk um going out of body all wonderful things but the land energy was what absolutely fascinated me to see all these lines and i was always up um always out in twilight early mornings before people came about because it was just so wonderful to see so there's all these formations but they have at particular times like equinoxes um the uh, longest and shortest days and the solstices and then on these cross quarter days there's kind of like these events that occur to sort of like mark the occasion we've reached this point on the wheel it's half past it's quarter past or whatever and they mark these occasions now the energy that arises out of hills and things at this time is absolutely phenomenal i think 
you heard, if those of you watched the video, you will have heard me describe some of it. Um, that's only touching on the surface of what is actually available to you. But, and I'm blessed, I know, I'm very unusual, very blessed to be able to see these things with my naked eye. It is not interpreted, it is not downloaded. To me, it's out there, as visible as anything else. To me, the air is permanently technicolored. You know, I see people's auras, I can't switch it off. It's not, you know, do you tune in? It's like, no, I can see your aura as I can clean, see your jumper. That's it. It's just a physical reality to me that all these electromagnetic spectrum fields are visible. So I spent a lot of time exploring these earth energies and trying to look just what consciousness was within them and what they sort of, what they did or what they marked or how they worked, how they affected us. Um, so that's what I spent years really quite as an adolescent child um, going into that and then it's been my life's work ever since because it was just so fascinating so um I suppose really I'd like you what questions do you have because it must be and I don't mean this in a patronizing or negative way but I mean I'm very blessed to be able to see them when you can't see them and you're trying to douse things that you can't see I always think it's a bit like putting a someone who can't see in a pitch black room with a disassembled bicycle. They've never seen a bicycle and you're telling them to put the bicycle back together. You know, how on earth can you do it if you've got really no conception of what things are out there? How can you find them? So I suppose if you could ask me something about the energy, you know, ask away. What do you what do you want to know? And I, I know this is like you may not be able to think of questions at the moment, but I'm sure the so I'm sure somebody will have some questions and that will start the ball rolling. So does anybody want to raise their hand or go first or type something in the chat box? Be brave. Now's your chance. Hey. Yes. Hi, it's Sean here. Hi, Sean. <laughs> um, bad hair day today. <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to ask, you know, when, um, as you said, uh, <laughs> As you know, I've seen energy, but um, so I can concur with what you're saying, but I don't not seen it in the landscape. So, again, you are blind where you've got a pair of dowsing rods and you're just like, show me this, show me that. And it's like, how how do you know what you need to find in the landscape, which is going to benefit you as a person? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, because, you know, we are enmeshed in these energies and some of them are fast moving and some of them are you know slow some of them are static but if you don't know what's there how do you know the right questions to ask you know you so the if you if you don't know you don't know do you so uh, the, when i always go to landscape places like i'm going to a sacred site on monday even though it's may the 5th it's not official beltane but it's bank holiday you know it's easier to get there with the kids so i go with an intention I take an intention with me of something that I want to accomplish or something that I want some information or some guidance on. And so it's not that we're just kind of going into a shop and saying, oh, I, I think that and I, I like the look of that and I'll take that. We're going with the intention of I want somebody to point the right thing at me that I want to come across. So in terms of dowsing, the, the one of the intentions you want to set is I would like to get positive dowsing responses, for instance, to the energies that are meaningful to, for me today, that are going to give me a learning experience today. Because there's only so many times I feel at certain sites that you can douse for the width of an energy line or how many bands it's got within it before it starts to become meaningless. Mm. Because you go, oh, there's a ley line and it's got eight bands. Yay. <laughs> And it's a lovely thing, but then what do you do with that information? Mm. It actually, it, 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 it's not applicable to your life, is it? So, you know, if you can find an energy feature, you don't necessarily know, have to know what it is. You then, you know, you can ask questions like, would it benefit my health to sit in it? For how long? You know, do I need, do I need to be engaged in this flow? Is this flow trying to draw attention to something about other flows of energy in my life? What is it trying to draw out in you? Because it can't speak language. So be very mindful of the things that you're, where the places you're drawn to. Like we often are as dancers, we're drawn to think, oh, I feel the need to go over there. Then do, mm -hmm. you know, fo follow your intuition. But the, the more carefully framed dancing questions you can ask, 
then that's what you you would move to move through. So it depends if you were going to a sacred site. So what is your intention when going there? What is your intention when you're working with that energy? Because a lot of dowsers, um, you know, when we're learning, we do a lot of mapping out, don't we? We do. A, we go to a sacred site. We want to know where the water comes in. We want to know where the energy lays go through. That's fine. We can map out a site. But then what? How do we actually engage with the consciousness of that site, with the spirit of place, in a meaningful and contemporary way? Because they want, they want to, they want to help us. You know, they want us to work in the here and now, not keep looking back at wondering what people were doing in the past. I mean, there's a definite technology to these sites that we have, I think, largely unfortunately lost, um, which we are starting to get back. But you know, in terms of massive objects and structure. Sorry, I've gone off track, but. What is your intention with working with these energies? The clearer you are about your intention so that they can work with you in a free will basis, then you can ask the questions that you need to ask. You know, okay. you go, you go yeah. with thinking, thinking mainly of not so much sacred sites, but mainly sort of woodlands and um, yeah. trying to trying to work with the trees and, and do things that, that benefits the land, but also health of other people as well. Yeah, so you, you would have to categorise really, I mean, there's multiple things there you're trying to do. So you're trying to work with the energy of the trees. So you need to ask things like, you know, is it okay for me to work with the trees today? Which tree do I have the trees permission? What, you know, what areas are you wanting the tree to help you with? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to remove detrimental energy? Are you trying to contact your ancestors? Are you trying to convey information through the wood that you want the wood to know something? What are you actually trying to do? It's really important when you work with earth energies that you've got a really clear intention, not necessarily an objective, but a clear intention. And then the energy can allow you to be guided in what in unfolding that answer for you. And it won't necessarily unfold in a great epiphany and, oh, and a beam of light coming down your head. You know, you will get often drip fed bits of information that you have to then follow through almost blind because we need to do that because we have to work with faith so we take that action and we have to be faith faith full of faith that the next unfolding will occur and then we will act on that and then the next unfolding will occur and we act on that um so yeah be, be really just be really clear about what are your intentions are you trying to remove detrimental energy from the wood are you trying to encourage people to see that trees have a consciousness they each have a being living you know they have an overarching consciousness but they have their own life force um that they're communication hubs that they transfer all this information that they work in family groups that they look after each other that they have a heartbeat what do what do you what we you know what are you trying to do is that clarity that will enable you to work with the energies much more productively than sort of wandering around with rods, rods in your hands so going oh this is great and then going home and going now what you know, it's it's about making it more practical and applicable. Does that make does that has that answered the question or if it hasn't, do say so. No, that's fine. Thank you. It's clarity and knowing what you're doing rather than just it, it's so tempting, isn't it? You just get your rods out, you're thinking, Oh, what shall I do today? And it's like, oh, right. And you just go with no purpose. Whereas I think you've got to have a, a purpose in place. Yeah, I think if you want to accomplish something, of course, we can always go just randomly dowsing, can't we? As long as we've got permission yeah. to go, it just starts to going out and dowsing some tree or us, you know, as long as the trees are willing, that's great. But uh, I mean, I use trees for all sorts of things. So I use trees to communicate with ancestors. Um, I also use trees actually because I have the marvellous nurturing capacities when I want to, want to feel nurtured. Um, and I, I also work with them with accessing the energy of communication because trees are fantastic communicators in their woods and there's a particular frequency that that is the energy of communication if you like and when I'm doing something even in my business I'll speak to the trees and go can I tune into that frequency of effective communication and can the soul of my business feel this frequency so that when I'm trying to communicate something to you know, people I know I can help in business in whatever way, whether that's with dowsing, geomancy or creating their own online business, then I want that energy embodied in my communication so that they, the, the ideal recipients subconsciously feel that and go, oh, that's interesting. So 
I use nature in quite unusual ways within my business. And it's not that I'm taking advantage of them because I do a lot of, um, you know, healing in woods. I plant trees. So my payback to them is, you know, there's always a reciprocal arrangement. What can I do for you? If you help me understand this mechanism, this energy, subatomic energy, what can I do for you to help you feel better? You know. Thanks, so, yeah. Sorry, yeah, so clarity. Sorry, Sean, you were saying? Yeah, no, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what questions have we got? Um, let me see. Um, okay. Okay. Da, 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 da. So, oh, is there a video to the link? Is there a link to the video? Let me just go down these. Uh, yes, there is. It, it's in the Facebook group. I did a video. It's also on YouTube. It's called Beltane Energy. So you can look up my YouTube channel and see it there if you want. It's also on my website. What energies would be best for to work with in the current Beltane Energy? What would be the most useful for us to work with? I think we've probably answered that, Kerry. It's that's Kerry's asked that. It's what is your objective? What what do you want to achieve? So it's not what's the most beneficial energy because at this moment the end the landscape and not just the landscape everything is being filled with fertile energy you know the sap is rising everything's feeling a little bit frisky you know now is the time if you want something to emerge later on in the year if you're thinking oh, you know i want to give birth to this idea um you know, I want to create something. I want to get a, I don't know, house extension, or I want to create something in my business, or I want to do something. This is the energy now where you really start need to acting upon it so that you'll see the results later in the year. Because nothing comes to us by inaction. Lighting a, writing affirmations and staring at a scented candle is not going to bring change. We have to take action. So when we take action, when the energy is already going that way it makes it so much easier because the whole universe at the moment or the whole universe well the whole of the earth at the moment is about let's get out there and make it happen make babies make this make that make the other it's this creative generative force it's this divine dance between the masculine and feminine going on at the moment we're shifting out of the darker feminine energies that we have in midwinter that's the introspection. It's the dark night of the soul, midwinter. We have to leave things behind in the autumn. It's very, we're very internalized. We're in our dark homes. We're doing a lot of thinking. And then as we come out now, my cat's just going mad behind me. As we come out now, we're leaving that darkness of the womb. We've started to come out in bolt, but now we're going out there in the world. We're going into the, the sun god, a masculine energy, the action taking, the I'm going to chase down that bison by God and I'm going to bring it down. It's that kind of energy that we're going into now. So that's the kind of energy that we all embrace. Um, it is. It's the going out there, the action taking. So think about what do you need to take action on in your life? Where are you not? If you're not where you want to be in some aspect, now is the time to take action, particularly with an eclipse. Because what an eclipse does, if we come in with a soul's path or a soul's dharma that says, I'm going to do this. And because of our ego and fear, we get distracted, we get um, disillusioned, we get disenchanted, we go off track. And we go, oh, no, I can just put up with the toxic job and the bad relationship. And it's really not that bad. Along will come an eclipse and go, you thought it was not that bad? No, you were over here. What bang, you go back down where you're meant to be and you'll find your relationship breaks up, you get the sack. <laughs> and it's very unceremonious, unapologetic. And the universe goes, no, there you were, carry on. And because we've got this Beltane energy, it's also doing that. It can be a weekend where we literally get super up, bonk, jettisoned, but not quite where we thought it would be. The easiest way to deal with that if it happens, and it happens, happens to me quite a lot with these eclipses, is to don't cling on to the past. Don't hold your safety barriers going, no. It's to just let go and go, okay, <laughs> let's ride this wave. Let's see where it takes me. Because it's often our ego. It's fear. We don't think we can manage. It's all too difficult. We've gone so far off track. Our fear um, holds us back. So it's much easier to just let go and say, you know, in the long run, catastrophic changes or challenging changes or unexpected changes even 
if in the long run they usually work out they well they do they work out for the best you look back and you go god thank god that actually happened at the time it was like but now yes so much benefit of it so we've got this so I say this eclipse which is going to go you know if you thought you were going to get away with not doing what you came to do <laughs> think again and um, then you've got all this energy then that's going to basically give you a right kick up the ass <laughs> <laughs> and send you where you need to be excuse my French so it's that is the energy that you've got so you can go out and you can sit in ley lines and absorb that power you can go to sacred sites you can go and hug a tree but all the energy everywhere is basically doing that just telling you off you go and of course we want to honor the landscape while we're doing that because it's these the landscape gives us the power and the lessons in our own lives, if that makes sense, because you live where you live right now in this particular ECOP, because that landscape where you live is, is holding up a mirror to the lessons that you need to need to learn. So the solution, the energy is present in your life at the same time. Um, and this is, this has got nothing to do with business. This is more, well, nothing to do with energy, but the, you, the law of the universe, one of the laws is the law of polarity. So you can't have day without night. They don't exist. They exist at the same time. You know, we're not in perpetual day. So the law of polarity says, you know, if you have a problem in your life, the solution is simultaneously present. So why often do we not see it? It's because our ego gets in the way. That might be ego that we don't want to be wrong, or ego and fear, but the solution is there. And often when we tap into the energy of the landscape, but these particular times, they rebalance all these frequencies. So we may have gone well off track. So absorbing the sitting for a moment in the landscape, resetting your nervous system. You know, woods, woods, for instance, heighten our sensory awareness. You know, being on energy ley lines, and these things, you know, it's kind of like a, a reset of our nervous system. So we can forget and leave behind all the stuff that's going around our head about why we can't do these things. And it says, this is you as a soul. This is your path, this is who you came into with. Aren't you wonderful? Yeah, you've got a bit distracted. And, you know, like me, I sit there and I go, I've got a bit distracted. I became an alcoholic. I ended up in an abusive marriage. I've got fat, my arse is huge. But underneath it all, I'm absolutely wonderful because I've survived it all and I keep going. And then the energy goes, yeah, you can do this. And I, you know, then I ask for lessons. What do I need to learn next? Can you present me with the next solution or the next unfolding so that I can action it and I will use earth energy to do a lot of that stuff because it opens up our awareness so that we allow ourselves to listen to that inner voice and we allow ourselves to receive sort of guidance so I will go there I'll ask my guides I will talk to the she the fairy folk anybody and anything I basically says if anybody's got anything that could help you know stick your hand up now because I'm all ears <laughs> don't hold back and give it to me straight um so yeah it's about taking the courage of your convictions and but the, the landscape energy it actually gives you the strength to do that because it kind of resets your system and brings you back into a sense of peace a sense of equilibrium a sense of surety because no matter where we are in life you know you look around you think well sun's going to come up tomorrow we're still we're still going to go into summer we're still going to have autumn and winter. Everything will just keep going. It's just me that feels stuck. So, you know, what can I do to get unstuck? Um, and that's kind of how I use it. And I use ritual, I use ceremony, um, because it's um, a marker of our intent, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Can someone let me know if that makes sense? Okay. Uh, what does Suzanne ask? Um, let me just go down to the bottom. I've gone up and I want to ask questions again. Um, let me go for Suzanne. Energy bands. Yeah, different energy lines have can have different bands within them, not all of them. So you'll have an energy line with widths, which some of them have got bands of energy with them, um, bands of energy going up that pulse at different times. So an energy line is not one static thing. It's almost like a fibre optic cable. It's got lots of different cabling bits often going down it. And some of these bands will be triggered at different times. So they've got a definite width, but particularly the solar lines and um, so the big lines like the Michael and Mary line and things like that, they have different band widths within them. Um, 
And um, yeah, they're different heights above ground. They resonate at different frequencies. So they look at, to me, they're all different colors. Um, and then you get bands of energy that just come across the ground like a wave out of fault lines. There's lots of different energy. I say it's never really one thing. It's, it's multiple things. And the, the term earth energy itself is this uniform overarching concept where it's like saying, um, you know, if you think of it as a forest, a forest is an overarching world, but what, the, you know, look at all the stuff that's in a forest, all the trees, all the undergrowth, all the insects, all the animals, you know, it's a whole ecosystem. And this, this energy is, is really an, an ecosystem. It is a, is a world within a world, or rather we're that world within that world. So it's, um, so there are so much, so many different things you can douse. And this is why I think we get, sometimes when we're dowsing, I've seen people look for one thing and pick up others. And then that interferes with their dowsing response. They get confused. Um, so then I would, have, I would have to go when I'm with them, show them that this sort of starts and finishes here and then it goes into something else, but you've got something else coming up here. And then that starts to explain the dowsing responses to them. And I'll try and map it out for them so they can draw it and see it and see what's happening. Um, yeah, so questions to trees. Do they have to be a yes, yes or no? Well, yeah, there would have to be a yes, no that you're answering, really, if you're dowsing around trees, because otherwise, how are you going to get the answer? So this is why dowsing, you really need to keep it simple. If you're asking a question that doesn't have a yes or no answer, um, then you're not going to get a very good result because you don't know what the maybe is or the if. The only time I use dowsing when I'm not looking for a yes or no answer is I'm looking for a demonstration of like force or spin. So I'll just, you know, obviously don't douse your arm right up in the air like this. But if I would say, you know, I would say, you know, what's the, I often do it for um, um, like the level of power going into something. So if I was, I don't do percentages because it's just, I, when I'm doing, honestly, I just find it boring. <laughs> they go 10, 20, 30. I'll just say like, what is the level of energy going through? Let me think of the, le the line outside, the line outside today. Don't need to know what line it is, but like, what is it going to be at midsummer? And then, uh, and then that shows me sort of like, I don't need to know how much power, I just need to know on a scale of what it is in midsummer to what it is today. You know, and then I would say, you know, what, what, if it, if it showed me what it was like a day ago before I worked on it, because there was a problem with some building work going on. And I looked out the line, I thought, oh, crap, it's it kind of shut down. Um, so I worked on it to, to work it back up. So that it's just a useful way of just saying it's just a quick demonstration of, you know, how much how much oomph, oomph has something got really? Because um, we can overcomplicate things sometimes. There are times when we need definite percentages of things, particularly in health or water, you know, particularly for boring it, you know, that kind of stuff. But generally, if you're looking to work with trees, you know, you're unless you're giving it just some lots of big hugs and lots of healing. If you're asking a specific question, you do need a yes or no answer. Is it okay for me to work with this tree? Yes or no? You know, is it okay for me to work with this tree today? Is it timely appropriate for me to ask these questions? And then frame your carefully, you need to carefully frame your dowsing questions so there is only a yes or no answer and you're not asking multiple things in the one question. As I teach in my dowsing mastery course, obviously, so that people get it right. Uh, what's the best way to connect to elementals? Any way you like. <laughs> Absolutely, any way you like. Um, I think we have this idea often as well that, you know, it's, um, it's some kind of woo and, you know, only the wise can do this and we have to be wearing a white robe and carrying a sacrificial chicken and it has to be on a this, that and the other. No, you can talk to elementals anytime you like. You can go out into your garden and go, hi! <laughs> And that's as complicated as it needs to be. So you can work with any elemental you want. Obviously, if you work in water, you can, you don't even have to be near water. You can, you know, you can put a glass of water on your table if you want to, or you can just think about water, or you can go near a body of water. It depends what you feel comfortable doing. You know, I will, I will often, if I'm, if I will, I work with all the elements. You say I work with the earth, air, fire, and water. And I do, I personally like to have them with me. So if I'm working with fire, I will light a candle. If I'm working with water, I tend to have a cut glass bowl that I put water in just because it sparkles and it likes the light. Um, again, smudging as well if I'm working with air. Um, and um, earth, you can use salt or I've got just some, 
nice beach bully stones as well that I'll work with to talk to little, you know, trolls or whatever in the ground. So any way that you are comfortable with, John, that makes you want to connect. And it's the thing is, it's the connection itself. We can tie all these things up around with a bit of pomp and circumstances and robes and ribbons, but actually it's the tuning in to the element itself that is the key component of this. And that really is, again, it's your intention. You wanna be A, absolutely clear that you intend to connect. And I, when I say intention, I mean real intention. You have to really mean it. There's a lot of intention that's like, oh, I intend this and I intend that. But you don't actually, people tend not to actually feel it with every cell of their being. You know, when you really want something, does this make sense to people? Someone let me know. When you really want something, you can feel it in every single cell of your being. You're like, I want this. It's non-negotiable. It's happening. And you feel like you're going to burst with it. You kind of, when, you, you, when you're tuning into these things, you, it's often easy to go in with that kind of energy that this is happening. Really feel it. Tune into your body. How does it feel? Not your mind. Because that will rub it on like my mind does. You'll, you'll have all these verbal stuff going round in your head. I want to connect to elementals. I wonder if I'm doing it right. I wonder if they know I'm here. How will I know when they're here? Will I feel anything? What do I want? You know, they're not interested in any of that crap. <laughs> they, what they tune into is the feeling of your body. So if you're feeling, if while that's going on, your body can be feeling any different things. You might be feeling, you know, if you tune into your body now, for instance, how do you feel? Is there any tension in your body anywhere? Are you feeling worried? You know, a lot of people at the moment are, you know, with everything going on in the world, there's this general state of unease within people about war, food, cost of living. There's this whole epoch of fear and uncertainty around at the moment. And we feel that in our bodies. Most people are stressed, overworked, worried, and we have this, you know, adrenaline rush going on all the time, which means we're often not in tune with how we're really feeling. So when we want to work with elementals, we don't want to just, we want to mean it, but we don't want to just rush in, bring in all our modern day gubbins with us. So it's really important to tune in to how you feel. Take some time just to take a few deep breaths, slow everything down. Just say, I'm going to leave all that out the door for a minute. Okay, there's too much month in my money. I'm going to leave all that out the door in a minute. I'm not going to think about it because right now I'm concentrating on communicating with earth, air, fire, water, or trolls in the ground, or dryads in the trees, or you know whatever it is you're trying to communicate with. And then you take a moment to be still. There's a few in breaths and out breaths. Put your awareness into your body first. How does your body feel? You know, if you've got stress in your stomach, you're feeling resentment about anything. So something still sat within you that's going to interfere with this process. So just, you know, you can't necessarily get rid of it, but just acknowledge that it's there and go, OK, that needs dealing with. And then put your awareness outside of yourself. So imagine you've got this aura. Put your awareness out here in the space around you. Feel that space. Feel that. What does it feel like on your skin? Does your skin feel cold? Where, where There is no definite edge to your aura. It kind of very gently bleeds into everything else. This is why, well, it doesn't bleed. We condense from everything else. So there is no definite edge. But it's, it's within this space here that you will often start to feel the presence of elementals. So when you tune in, just put your awareness outside. What are you picking up in your senses? Is there a noise or a sense of cold? Do you feel the sense of a presence? You may not feel anything at all. You know, not everybody is sensitive in that way, but tr just be still enough to try and lose your modern thinking, if that makes sense. It's quite a primal act. We're trying to sense the presence of something that we can't see is ephemeral, ethereal. So we sense that presence. Whether you feel anything or not, so you invite it into your presence. So you say, you know, I want to communicate with the elemental of earth, air, fire and water and you invite it into your presence. And to start with, when you start doing this, you're not really asking anything, you're just developing a relationship. 
because you do, you wouldn't you wouldn't meet somebody for coffee having never met them before and say, sit down to go oh by the way can you sort my life out while I'm here it's just you know they're going to run like Billy and Mario aren't they you know so when you so when you are introduced to these elementals for the first time you want to build a relationship you want to learn you want you're going on a journey of personal spiritual development with them that will enable you to fully embody your life's mission wherever that may be you know it more than I um so you acknowledge you, you invite them into your presence and start with you just get used to sensing that something has entered my field you don't even have to articulate what it is and whether you feel them or not you say thank you thank you for being here even if you can just feel eerie silence and feel like a pillock sat there talking to nothing you know you just always thank them for their presence it's not their fault if you can't feel them so you always say thank you and then gradually you can start to work with them with your intentions so you you get used to feeling them and then you can douse is it okay for me to ask for something today rather than just so if you get a yes then you can have your intention for the day or what you want information on or something you're trying to some issue you may be trying to resolve and you can ask the elemental that's going to best support you to come in and then you tune into their presence you thank them for being here and then you can say because i do this with the spirit of my business for instance every day i say i set my clear intention so today i want to accomplish x y and z so i picture the task and i picture the desired outcome this is how i want it to work out so i go from here this is me starting off and this is my desired outcome. Now I leave them to fill in the bit in the middle. I don't say it's got to happen through X, Y, and Z. I go, this is where I am. Like, so for instance, with the spirit of my business, I'll go, I've got this idea for something I want to do. And I'll say, this is it. This is the event or the outcome full of people. Well, I'm a great time. I've earned money. I've learned a lot. It'll enable me to deliver to more good people. How that middle bit fills in, that's when we allow our intuition and for them to guide us, for them to put the synchronicity and the coincidence in front of us so that we go oh i never would have thought about myself um as they land something in front of you but you can work with elementals to do that as well um what what is it you're trying to achieve by working with them and to connect them it can simply just be to say bloody thank you for being there you no know, water is much maligned you know and overused and mistreated water is probably one of the, the most stressed elements that there is at the moment um so you know it a water blessing is a worthwhile thing to do every day anyway well not maybe not every day but fairly regularly and this is why beltane is you know it's so important is this well blessing this thank god for this life-giving force because water is one of the most phenomenal substances that we're only really just starting to get to grips with so i started working with the consciousness of water probably when I realised it had consciousness, let's say going to Ireland at the age of nine um, and realising that water had consciousness. And I've spent years studying, you know, um, how we interact with it, how, how, to, how to work with it, how to help it so that it can help us. Um, we know it carries information, memories, it carries information across distances. Um, and at the moment is the desertification of the world that is the root of most of the world's problems in terms of wars, population movements, access to natural resources, is our abuse of water. Um, so we have, a, we have a lot of healing to do when it comes to working with water. Um, so if any, and because Beltane was obviously associated with well blessings, um, it would be as, you know, doing a well, it doesn't have to be a well blessing. You can, you can bless your kitchen tap. It doesn't, you know, you, it doesn't have to be, you know, a sacred site. Any water, all water is sacred. The water in your toilet is sacred. And the fact that we do that to water is, you know, beggars belief when it's such an intelligent substance. You know, water is so intelligent. It has so many different states. There is so much we do not understand scientifically about the molecular structure of water. Its behavior in many ways acts contrary to the low, known laws of physics in the universe. It sh water, water should not be um, the way it is. It, it, it behaves in such you know, amazing ways and just amazing with, without water being what it is, we wouldn't have the planet that we have. Um, and, we, and we forget that just in terms of you know, how ice works, how water moves, its surface tension, its viscosity, 
its ability to absorb heat without water, um, this planet would not be where it is. And it's not just that, you know, it's the information that carries, it's the how it works in our body. It is the carrier of everything. It is the one of the most, you know, it, it is, it, 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 I can't stress how important it is. And that's what I'm trying. I'm doing some great research with water at the moment. So, um, yeah. And uh, and I've I did put a post in the group yet. Actually, if anybody wants to do a workshop with me on working with the consciousness of water, then I have one. I have run a few times, but I haven't run it for a while. So, if you want, if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, yeah. So connection the other, and it's that same method of tuning in and inviting in whether it's earth, air, fire, water, or even the consciousness of, a, of an energy lay or the spirit of place, if you're at a particular site or the dryad of a tree. It's the same process. We wanna put ourselves to the back because we can become very human centric. I'm here, I've doused this rod. I'm going to sort this energy out like some omnipotent God, you know, and it's, we need to take a bit of more of a back seat often because particularly at these times of year, there's lots of, Elemental consciousness, fairies, whatever you want to call it, they're all, um, you know, the fairy faith is a, just briefly, I'll just say the fairy faith is a worldwide system of naming, whether we call it a pixie or the old man of the ant mound like you have in Mexico or whatever it is. There are fairy names for fairies in all indigenous cultures because we recognize there are consciousnesses out there that do stuff. In semi-scientific language, they're, they're um, um, morphogenetic fields. So they hold the blueprint of that particular thing as it comes into manifest matter. Um, the morphic resonance carries between them, so all things learn. They hold the energetic blueprint of that thing in the you know, subatomic level. So they create all this life. So the fairy faith is, 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 a, is an acknowledgement of all these things, these consciousnesses out there that enable life to continue and manifest. They are responsible for the manifestation of trees or that particular, I'm gonna say branch of tree, breed, a particular type of tree, um, you know, and that is their job. So we can invite the consciousness of anything into our life. It's just that some of them are, you know, hard to deal with. You know, it's much easier to talk to the consciousness of a fairy than something intergalactic you know some of these consciousnesses are huge which is you know why we probably embodied them as gods didn't we the god of mars you know it's because it's quite hard to talk to a planet you know uh, we don't feature much on their scale of relevance as an, as an individual even though we're part of the whole big soup but some of these super consciousnesses but some of these er energies are incredibly powerful and it's you have to be in the right state to tune in and allow some of it into your field because it's a bit like sticking your finger in a socket with some of them and you're not careful, you'll blow your fuse, you know? So we do have to be really mindful and really careful when we're dealing with um, certain bigger energies and, and certain sites have energetic structures that enable that, that are like a protective mechanism of the world that enable it, enable us to be able to do that on a much easier way. Um, so you know, when sites are aligned to particular astronomical alignments or planetary energy, um, and planetary grids that crop up, crop up at certain sites, they're a great way of um, tuning in to particular, the particular planetary energy that they correspond to. So um, planetary grids, for anybody who's not come across them, or magic squares, there are squares that are so many squares. So it's, you know, it's a three by three square, or it's a six by six or a nine by nine. And they correspond to different, often to different planetary energies. Um, and that enables you to talk to sort of, consciousness of planets but they're not always present they're transient they come and they go so again um that's something that i've been you know good to so anyway let me get around to the questions i'm not managing this very well um yeah um yes and no questions oh trees so Susanna, of course with the first question yes and no but can you have more of a conversation with them yes so long as you're asking yes and no questions yeah um I think in the video, it says Janice, you mentioned Beltane during the day was a good time to talk to the fairies. Oh, here we are. Let's talk about this. You talk um, a bit about the fairies. How do they present and how would someone like me who doesn't see energy know they're around? Yeah, follow that method that I've told you, particularly at twilight. 
as as twilight becomes night um there's a huge shift that occurs so one of the irish legends that i became fascinated with was the way fairies move between mounds in lunar phases there are lots of legends of people seeing whole tribes of fairy consciousnesses trooping out of mounds under the full moon walking across the landscape in all different shapes and sizes and then go back in the next mound and that is often when people got taken away by the fairies and they would disappear out of their lives for many years and then they would come back miraculously unchanged 15 years later much like ufo abductions that we get now instead that also occur at ge near geological fault lines so in traditional terms people used to get taken by the fairies at certain times and they would see fairies and they would disappear a fairy mounds are always are often near geological fault lines now ufo abductions occur when people see lots of lights they're often near geological fault lines they get abducted at particular times a year so it's our mind coping with a phenomena where we disappear out of the normal time space paradigm that we used to of past present and future or how we like to think about it so there are there are particular energy occurrences that occur in twilight and this is seems to be to do with light changes as well so as we're going from the blue green day spectrum into the orange red of night that obviously shifts the light photons and the properties of light you know the electromagnetic prototype of the photons you know we're leaving that behind that seems to enable all these consciousnesses to much easier move uh and they don't always like us there quite frankly they don't always want us around we're noisy we make a mess of things we litter the place up we're often unaware of what they do they've got a bit fed up with us at times because we don't have this relationship with them um so yeah so i as a child i've seen them in many in many ways is how i've seen them as a child i have seen them as all sorts of pictures fairies i'll see them as uh, moving symmetrical forms sometimes i don't know if they present in any particular way um i tend to treat i tend to see energy in terms of geometry um but it also still has a consciousness so it's various people will see them sense them in all different types of way so again it's using that method of tuning in and just basically saying you know are there any elemental or fairy consciousnesses around again they're on a spectrum of you know you can have the consciousness of the tiniest little flower you can have the spirit of place you can have the spirit of a wood um it depends what level so i would try and tune in rather than trying to tune into what is a band a whole frequency of energies i would try and pick if you like one bandwidth so what is your affinity do you have an affinity with what kind of person are you some people love rocks some people love trees some people love water where is your affinity and then i would try and tune into something where you have a natural affinity where you're more likely to be open to that to say i'm going to wait till it's twilight and i'm going to go and sit by this stream and i'm going to invite i'm just going to say hello i know you're here i'm not going to interfere i don't want anything i just want to i want you to know i know you're there and if you could just you know if i can feel anything that would be that would be great um and and do it that way because um yeah but if you you know there, there are various different levels of consciousness within, within the fairy so i would say i will work with consciousness of a pebble if i need to um but it was the, the what what the irish call the she their fair old-fashioned fairy folk that were the ones that really ha helped me to hone my skill in this uh, which they taught me as a child um various methods or showed me as a child how to do it so and they are um they're not they're not small <laughs> you know they're not they're there you know if you put if they were personified they they can be quite big they can be you know they're like not exactly giants but they're they're you know taller than the average person put it that way if they want to personify um they will be quite something and you'll get them um within stone circles you know at sacred sites you will often get a she of its affinity with that rock will inhabit that stone so it's like a consciousness within the stone and then you'll get the spirit of place which encompasses the whole area you'll get consciousnesses traveling down lines and processional ways so it's almost like all this it, a ritual and ceremony goes on of its own um, of these consciousnesses they have things to do at particular times of year as i say and 
we can we can get in the way um, because we can we're often so out of tune with ourselves and natural world so if you imagine that when all this stuff is going on there's kind of a noise element to it there's a harmony like a symphony and there's all these noises and it's wonderful to listen to and then along comes a human being and it's literally like someone's dropped an old saucepan in the middle of it and you think oh my god you know <laughs> we, we're not in tune with it so actually uh, when evening becomes the light that's often the time that people get this this um sense you know you need to leave now um the biggest the biggest thing from one of one of the things that happened to me i remember years ago i was in a um, it's a private labyrinth. It's called Troy Labyrinth. It's on private land. And I went there to do a course on um, um, astronomical alignments and orthographical projections. That's basically how we work out where the astronomical alignments are in the sky for this plot of land and how we map that on the ground. So where we would put the standing stones, where we would, you know, so that when we come back in midsummer, the sun is actually rising above the middle of that stone or that notch and we haven't missed it. So I went there to do this course to show people how to do this at this labyrinth. We were using the labyrinth to communicate with the spirit of the place, to do a ceremony with North. And I was in there in the evening and I thought, I'll just, I'll just go in this last time because it's really special. And I went round and had a walk, walk round and had this, this woman was with me. And I said, it's getting a bit dark. I said, I think we're going to get a message to go in a minute. And then as we turned around, we both saw this. And anybody know the Patronus and Harry Potter, you know, is a deer, is this white glowing deer. Well, literally this massive white stag just walked across, made out of light into the labyrinth. And, we, and I thought, oh, I bet I can see this. This is wonderful. And I turned to my companion and obviously she could see it as well because she just went grey. She'd never seen anything like it. And she just went absolutely. And as I turned around to say, we've just been asked to leave. She'd already gone. She was just never seen anyone run so she had just turned around and hightailed it out of there. And I was like, I was just about to say, we just got a polite message to leave now. And it was like, yeah, she was gone. I thought, well, she's got the message. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> so I just said, thank you very much. Put my little offering on the ground and out, and out I went. Yeah, so, but you will, you can get nudges that say, you know, say, well, I've got some stories about things that people have seen when they're with me. But they, most most people are scared of witness, but there you go. Because if you're not used to seeing something like that, you know, it's pretty much, let's face it, going to be shocked and sister, isn't it? So, um, you know, we don't expect Harry Potter world to be real. Um, even though a lot of it is. Um, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, so that you, you can get a nudge, basically, that says you need to, you know, um, uh, no more, no, it's like no mystic pigeon. Oh, yeah, Sean, my mystic pigeon, yeah. I used to joke about having a mystic pigeon. I still do actually. People get so tired of being mysticism and you know want to be, have this guru and want their tribe around them and to be adored. And you know, my mystic pigeon has told me this, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's mindful that your ego might be getting in the way if you get like that. I I mean I know I've got a massive ego. I'll hold my hands up to that and say, but at least I own it. <laughs> I make no bones about my ego. So Right, who's this, Kerry? I used and felt energy sites to be like a telephone line. So I talked to my friend in Glastonbury, um, saw and heard, and my friend heard it. You know, yes, you can communicate across vast distances with lines. Um, as a child, I used to actually project down them. So I used to get on the lines and then just leave, leave my body and go, wee. Um, I still do that sometimes, but I'm a bit more careful now as an adult than I was as a child, has to be said. But I think that's just my fear sometimes gets in the way. Um, so yeah, they're a great way for springboarding you out of body. Um, and at these times of year, but you need to know, uh, I, you know, I always had help from the she and people like that, because you wouldn't just want to leave your body and not have a safety mechanism, not have your safe word, if you like, to come back in. Um, because if you're not used to it, it can be that initial oomph. It's not, it's the initial oomph of leaving that normally is what pulls people back again because they go, oh, I'm out, oh, and in that moment, they're straight back in again. Um, so, yeah, so I, you know, I can say I had, I had various help from various other beings that helped me get my head around that as a child, but I'm a lot more fearless than I was then. And, yeah. I think there's only really much to be bothered about, really. I think it's just as I've got older kids and stuff. Um, right, so has anybody got any more questions? 
Does anybody want to raise their hand? Is there anything else that we've, because we kind of got a bit around the houses, but I really wanted to know what people wanted to know. Um, so that I, you know, really, I, so just really so that I could ask, answer your questions. So there's, there's a lot going on. There will be a lot of transitory energy phenomena that will occur on the May the 5th, and it will be occurring on the run up to May the 5th. So things will start to be sort of going to this point now. I mean, they'll carry on after that, but it's just this May the 5th is kind of like, it's a bit like we have May Day celebrations where we want to put frocks and dance around. And woo, we want to do all those kind of things. In, in effect, nature's kind of doing that as well as we've reached this sort of point. Um, so we have a lot going on. There's a lot of energy, um, you know, this because the energy is in Taurus as well. You've got to think about the energy of the bull, if you like. So a spring bull, me coming from farming family, you know, a spring bull is wants to be pretty rampant, shall we say. He has one thing and one thing only on his mind at this point in time. And he wants to go out there and sow his seed and do all that. So you've got that kind of um, pushing energy. On the other hand, you've also got this very grounding energy because once done, he likes to sit down, sun on his back, chew the curd, he's patient, he'll wait till the day is long, he won't be moved, he's quite happy. You've got these two kind of energies around the Taurus energy, which Beltane is in. So on the one energy, it's saying, go for it. But on the other hand, it's also saying, don't just go with mad abandon, you know, practice patience. You're in it for the long game. Just keep going and you will get the rewards at the end of it. So there's these two types of energy going on. So it's quite interesting how they play out in, in energy lines in terms of how the masculine and feminine of the serpent lines intertwine and all kind of things. So, yeah, so I hope you've enjoyed that. You can unmute yourselves if you've got anything to say. If anybody wants to come on board and say anything. Um, so it's not constantly the sound of my voice, as I'm aware I can go on and on and on. Suzanne, did you have a question? I think I've answered it, Faye. It was basically, um, I can douse for this, using the use of sound and things like tuning forks and bowls and what have you to help communicate with some of these elementals. Yeah, you can, you can use anything. You yeah. can use anything you like. You can yeah. tune in and, you know, would, would sound yeah. help you open the channels, would whatever. And they like sound, you know. Mm. They like us to be active and engaged and they don't... There's a level of commitment that we show when we go out with our tuning forks or with our ceremony, with our feathers, with our you know, sacred rug of mystic pigeon, or when we sing to the water, we're showing a level of commitment that we, we're we showing up for them. And we're not worrying about what other people think or what my neighbors think when I walk around my garden at night with my smudging stick, you know, I'm not bothered about all that. They, are, they like us to show up. They like mm. us to show up with enthusiasm, with sort of childlike curiosity, not childish, you're not being childish, but you're going, yeah, show me. Let me, you know, and don't be afraid of using your imagination. You know, our imagination gets dismissed. Oh, it's only in your imagination. So what? All your thoughts only exist in your head. They're not out there as an objective reality. What you believe about the world is only your belief. It's not written in stone out there. Everybody has an entirely different belief about how the world operates. Your imagination is just as valid thought processes as your conscious thoughts. And it's a way of your intuition starting to talk to you you know same as dreams dreams are your problem solving mechanism they're your mechanism for resolving stuff that, that's gone on in the day and your imagination is that tool into your subconscious mind so don't be afraid to use whatever suits you you might not you know if you're a crafter you might think well I'll just take my crochet and go and sit on the line for half an hour you might go up with your coloring pens just think i'll do it for half an hour just to get that monkey mind quietened down enough so that you've got a kindly different slight sense and if, if that's working with singing bowls or working with tuning forks or just lighting a great big bonfire if you've got the space and just sitting watching the flames just watch them all change and turn because fire is fascinating just enough to shut that monkey mind down that's wittering on and trying to find processes or you know being too rigid in your thinking, I suppose. Is the, is the well, thing. Thank you very much indeed for this session. It's been really, it's been both great fun and and um, very interesting and helpful. Thank you. 
Yeah. Good. I'm glad. So if anybody's got any questions afterwards, you can, of course, you know, uh, message me. And for those people who are catching some replay, because we couldn't go ready live because of Zoom, um, then put your comments below and um, I will, of course, get back to you. But yeah, so um, yeah, there's, there's, there is a lot to DAOs, but if you're just into dancing energy lines, for instance, you can just go and see how wide they get at Belte, you know, mark the edges one day, see what they, where they're moving about, what they're doing, what's the rate of flow, for instance, you know, if you rated it out of 100 today, what would it, what is it on May the 5th if you got a line? You can, you, can, you can do that even in your own garden. You will have very small lines everywhere. Some of them might only be three foot long and it might only be, you know, not much, half the thickness of your little finger, but they will still be responding to this melt, this energy. Mm -hmm. um, and the water will still be moving about with the, you know, the, the lunar tides. So there's always something you can engage with if you're just into strict dows, not strict dows, that's the wrong word, but dowsing that just says, this is line, this is how wide it is, this is how it moves. You know, it's often these things are in a state of flux. So it's just great, great to, um, yeah, have, have fun with, you know, just go out and explore it and be open and, you know, just... You can be a bit anal about things a lot of the time and it's just really is you know get your head out your own ass and go out there and do it excuse my expression <laughs> just go out with wild abandon you know <laughs> and have fun with it and as long as you as long as you've got no malicious intent if you're just going out to engage and explore and you're going to be respectful and you're going to say thank you very much at the end you know and you'll be fine you'll be fine you can ask your guides to come in and play you know just open up those conversations with them. So, um, Janice, like that comment about our imagination. Yeah, your imagination is a key tool. It's a key tool. And, um, you know, the brain chemistry around, around um, you know, sacred sites is really interesting as well. And particularly in terms of brain chemistry when we go into twilight as well, how light spectrum changes affects neurochemistry. There's a lot we can do to shift our own consciousness by using the natural world. You know, woods change our brain chemistry the early morning changes our brain chemistry what wakes us up the sun setting changes our brain chemistry it's what prepares our brain for sleep so there are so many physiological processes that go on within our body that the trigger for them to happen is an outside event beyond our control so you know there's a there's a liver cleanse you know that your liver does every night what triggers that is the moon <laughs> So it's like we are intimately connected with these forces outside of us. And yet it's not, you know, it's so little of this is taken into account. We are we are tied up sometimes in bigger forces and bigger pictures as well. And it's it doesn't absolve us of responsibility for our own life, but it does mean that sometimes we you think where well, you've got to ride, you know, you've got to ride out what's happening. But like we can see at the moment, you know, there's no way anybody in a war zone, for instance, signed, you know consciously signed up to that did they they weren't writing out affirmations to say hey i'd like a war you know nobody consciously signed up to that we go we are in involved in bigger epochs that are going on in terms of the cycle of time and we can get caught up in these things um, on, on a karmic level who knows whether we choose to have that experience exactly in that way who the hell knows um, but yeah so it's engaging with these forces enables us to sort of manage what we can also accept that there are times where things just have just got to unfold in divine order and we've just got to go with it be patient and see and see what unfolds and um you know do do the best that we can so yeah so go out and chat to some trees and talk some water and have some rocks around for a tea party you know whatever <laughs> whatever it is that you want to do but go out and engage with the energies because they, they will appreciate it when you when you first start to talk to elementals or fairies by the way the one thing you might get to start with is a bit of a you know they'll kind of be going she's talking to us you know she wants you she wants you you know and they're a bit they can be a little bit reticent in certain areas to come forward in a lot of them will then go oh thank god i've been crying out to work with you because we need you as this conscious force to enact this we want you to do certain things because we are in a unique position and that we can form a bridge between different consciousnesses actually and it's a very humbling position so a tree is conscious but it can't instigate change in its environment you know we can we can stop a wood being chopped down 
or we can plant more trees. Now, water is water and it changes our geography, but it's only that, but it, it can't do the things that we can do. So we are mobile, we have um, our day-to-day -day consciousness, we have our ability to tune into this other film. So we are in a unique and humbling position to be able to work with all these consciousnesses and this energy, but do something productive out of it. Unfortunately, we kind of, you know, we don't, we haven't, we've forgotten, whatever. Um, so now when we are willing to open up and work with them that, in that way, then normally from, from, the, from, from the initial stunned silence that somebody's actually aware that they're there, then they will often be quite willing to work with you. And you can get really positive signs very quickly that they're, they're willing, you know, that strange animals cropping up on your doorstep early morning. You think, where on earth does that come from? You know, just signs and symbols will start to appear because they don't speak language. They're not going to turn up as a voice. They're not going to turn up with a placard on your front door, a little troop of fairies going, we're here to help. You have to be look for these signs, symbols and synchronicity and shifts in the atmosphere, changes. What have you been guided to do? And listen to all these things because that's really how they're going to communicate. Um, and that's learning, isn't it, to interpret these things. And this is why dowsing is so useful because... When we're just intuiting things, I'll finish in a minute. When we're just intuiting things, you can get this sign. You go, oh my God, it's obviously a sign. We look at the sign and it's like looking at a blank sign. There's no clear instructions, is there? Do we go left, do we go right, do we go back? I'm thinking, I've got a choice now. This is obviously a sign, but what does it mean? What does it mean? You know, what does it mean? I've seen so-and-so three times. What the hell does that mean? And this is why doubting is so important and so useful as a tool for personal spiritual development, because we can ask those carefully framed questions that give us a yes or no answer and follow that thread. So when we get a sign, we can ask questions about whatever we think the sign pertains to. Does it mean I should, I don't know, is it my best interest to move house? Is it my best interest to move this summer? Is it my best interest to move to X part of the country and break all those questions down? And then that will give you a clear, definitive course of action to take rather than it's a sign. Now what? You know, and this is why dowsing is a tool that I absolutely love because it enables you to make sense and fathom what can otherwise be the unfathomable. Does that make sense? I know I always ask that, does that make sense? But sometimes I hear what, what I hear in my head isn't necessarily what comes out of my mouth. <laughs> it's that kind of mind. So yes, and this is why getting really, practicing your dowsing, getting discerning in your question forming and learning how to ask really clear questions with a yes or no answer that will enable you to ask those difficult questions about your life that will then give you the steps to, um, do something about the issue that you face or engage with energies in a way that's going to enable you to open up, to feel them, to find the thing that's right for you, that's going to enable you to have these experiences of something outside of yourself that isn't you, but that you can, you know, give more meaning to your life. You can feel more in tune with everything and more powerful over you controlling your own destiny um, than floating around wondering what the hell's going on most of the time and stressed to death. So dowsing is a, is a key tool. It's one I use extensively in my life and in my business, extensively. Because even though I work with the spirit of my business, for instance, on a very intimate way, and I have exercises and I help people to tune in when they are creating their business to work on that soul level, so that you're listening to the soul of your business. What's its path? What does it want to become to fulfill that part of your life? You're not intuiting answers because that's no use in business, for instance. You want a clear course of action about what you want to do. So I use dowsing to get that clear course of action. But that you might want to do that in any aspect of your life. Big personal decisions that you need to make about things. Which way do you need to go? Which way do you need to jump? Um, and that will enable you to move with much more confidence rather than thinking, well, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark and hope this is the way forward. And there's never a wrong path, is there? Every path has learning. But do you want to take the long route and have lots of lessons? Or do you want to take the quick route? <laughs> Where you go, right, I've got that now. Now I can move on. Um, 
you know, otherwise that lesson that you haven't learned will keep showing up with different players and different guises and different circumstances until you learn it. And yet dowsing is a way of unpicking when we're absolutely honest with ourselves, unpicking what needs to be unpicked because we can't move forward unless we face the truth. It's only the truth that will set us free. There's no avoidance tactics. There's no like, you know, let's say you need to change job. You know, there's no way of getting around that if you're in the wrong job or you need to end a relationship that's not serving you, it's toxic, but you just haven't had the courage to do it. You have to be absolutely honest with yourself about what needs to change. No, no hiding, no lying to yourself, no pretending. Otherwise, you are handing over your power of your own destiny. You're handing over your power to other people. And um, that's not the way forward. And, you know, nature, spirits and consciousnesses want us to fully embody ourselves. What's and all? But they want you to fully embody who you are. And that makes the method of communication. I expect you to be perfect, but it makes the... It makes the method of communication much easier if you're not showing up with this front of pretense, this face that you put to the world. Oh, I'm okay. Absolutely, everything's fine. When it's not, <laughs> show up. They're not going to grass on you. They're not going to tell you off. They're not going to show up as you are. You know, if you're feeling vulnerable, upset, or fearful, show up like that. You know, they'd, they'd rather. You know, they'd rather you were. They don't want you to turn up with all this monkey mind, but if you, you, it's still okay to show up and go, God, I'm feeling really unsettled by what's happening. And just be honest about it. Or I face this big decision and I don't know what to do. You know, but just own it. Don't, don't pretend, yeah. But everything's all right when it isn't because that just doesn't serve us in the long run. So, yeah, so what's thoughts, Carrie says? Um, uh, I made that this door. Told Spirit, I want to clear any karma all in this lifetime <laughs> changed my mind yeah that's a lot to take on isn't it <laughs> i want to do all my car everyone whoa okay yeah i mean you can do depends on which car you put in, at the end of the day. <laughs> whether you've come in with a whole baggage train or whether you've just bought hand luggage <laughs> so yeah and we can and we and we can clear things all the time you know you can use dowsing dowsing to guide you in emotional freedom technique for instance gone slightly off belt aid but it's much easier to communicate with these energies. So when, when I struggle is when I'm not in flow and being authentic, when I've got my ego's got in the way for whatever reason, it might be fear or I've, you know, got ahead of myself or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I will use dowsing to, to, you know, release things or I'll use emotionally the tapping technique um, for self-forgiveness or whatever, whatever needs to occur. Um, and those techniques are quite powerful, so don't underestimate them. Um, so if you have got things, tap, but tapping is a really gentle way of doing it. So if you've got things that you're not happy with, do look up EFT, emotional freedom technique, and practice some tapping. Um, yeah, I mean, I did a lot last night around self-forgiveness and money and shame and all sorts of things were coming up with this moon because it was in particular, it's in a particular house um, in my sign. Because so each 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 moon, by the way, each lunation, new or full moon, yes, it occurs, it has its astronomical energy of whatever sign it's in. But it's, you have different lunar houses within your star sign. So sometimes it'll be turn up in the family, you know, in your family's area or your money area or whatever. And, you know, this moon happens to be in mine all about money and possessions. So I took the opportunity for the eclipse so I can shed loads of stuff when the eclipse occurs all around shame, bad money decisions, uh, where I've lost money, where I've had money taken, family stories around money um family stories around possessions around worth self-worth um how sex and money get tied up um all sorts of things that i wanted to get rid of because it comes up in waves doesn't it we think we've dealt with something and then it comes rearing back up again at a later time a different aspect different challenge of it so yeah um tapping is eft it's the emotional freedom technique and there are loads of videos on youtube um, there are talk you through videos where you, they'll just talk you through the process. Um, I've forgotten his names. Yeah, I mean, I've got all sorts of things on tap and it's something I use a lot um, when I'm feeling um, all the time because it's really quick. <laughs> so, yeah, you can use that. It's just nothing to do with Beltane energies. Yeah, I suppose what I'm saying is these energies are out there. They're in pure form. They're perfect. 
and we as human beings get distracted, disenfranchised from ourselves um, as life deals us the lessons that we came in to deal, but we've all found them hard and we end up battle scarred and weary. And working with these energies didn't, working with these energies enables to uh, uh, heal from these wounds and unlock, but it also enables us to give something back to the landscape to work with these energies in a way that is um, conducive to the well-being of all, all life that we share this planet with, that we, are, we work with it in honoration, we, you know, well, it's a, you know, everything from, you know, if you're building a house, you'd want to be really careful, you know, what energy you're putting it in, what, what emotional, what emotion, emotional freedom technique, yeah, what, um, what consciousness is you use that area in what way, what are you interrupting? You know, we need to be, we need to be much more mindful of how we engage with these other consciousnesses. We just kind of go out there and do what we want with the landscape. And uh, that's, we've made a bit of a mess of a lot of places by doing that. Our energy lines and things will move, don't get me wrong, but, you know, we, um, yeah, we've got a lot to answer for as a species, haven't we, let's face it, um, how we use the earth as a resource. And even a lot of environmental stuff, it's still about preserving resources, um, but the earth is not a resource, you know, it's not, an, it's not a body to be harvested organs out of any more than we are, you know, so... Um, not to cry an organ donorship or anything like that, by the way, but we don't have to, people don't come up without your permission and take bits off you, do they? So, and yet we do that with the planet all the time. You know, so it, there's a whole, we need to really reframe how we look at the earth and working with earth energies puts a completely different perspective on these systems and how they operate. So, yeah, um, we've, we've been an hour and a half, nearly an hour and a half, so we better go now. So I hope that's answered everybody's questions. I hope you've enjoyed it. And the, this has been recorded, so it'll go up in the Facebook group. It won't be taken down. It'll be there. And it'll also be on my on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, if you want to catch it there for anybody to catch it on replay. Uh, but thank you very much for joining me, ladies. I hope you have enjoyed that. And I will see you in the Dowsing Masterclass group very soon, or if you're in my Divine Feminine CEOs group for women in business, if any of you are, um, I will see you in there too. So have a great day, all. And I will see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. It was great. Bye.